Let's pray. Lord, uh, we come before you this morning eager to hear your word. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Open our hearts uh, that you may direct our lives. I pray this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you might be aware there is a yearly project known as Angel Tree, which delivers Christmas presents from prison inmates to their children. Now, this often takes participants to some economically poor areas. And one such participant tells this story. He says, I recall one home I visited in which a loving grandmother in her 60s cared for three grandchildren. The grandmother was a dear Christian woman, active in her church, but she lived in abject poverty. She had no job, and she received no money from her grandchildren's father, who was in prison, or mother, who was a drug addict, to help feed the children she was raising. Because she was not the children's legal guardian, she also received no money for them from the government. And those in her church were evidently as poor as she was. She had to fish in the local pond to feed the family, and her home was in terrible disrepair. Cockroaches covered the walls and floors, ceilings, and furniture. I was afraid to sit down, and I kept walking around the room to keep the bugs from crawling up my legs. But the poor woman, as poor as she was, she gave what little she had to raising the grandchildren whom she loved. I, on the other hand, forgot about praying for them after a couple weeks, and I never did give any money to help them. So God calls us to be like that grandmother, not to be like me. He wants the members of the Christian family to care for one another so deeply that they sacrifice to help one another. He wants us to love so much that we cannot stand to see one another suffering so that we give whatever we can to help. Not necessarily financial, but in whatever way we can. And he does not want us to do this just once, but rather God calls us to a life of loving service for others. In Paul's final section of his letter to the Corinthians, he calls his readers to this same kind of loving service. And so today we're going to conclude our series in 1 Corinthians. This is a letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth. I'm sure by now we've all gotten the idea that there were quite a few problems going on at this church, <coughs> many of which, in a similar manner to the church today, these problems were caused by the culture around them and the atmosphere of the city in which they found themselves. So last week we concluded chapter 15, which is the section that dealt with the resurrection. Paul discussed Christ's resurrection as the basis for our resurrection. We looked at the certainty and necessity of the resurrection and what our resurrected bodies would then be like. And so today we're going to what appears to be a totally separate section, uh, unrelated, if you will. In this conclusion to the letter, Paul urges his readers to loving service we're going to answer the question, what is Paul's final call to action in this letter? And so, if you would open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we'll begin in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. There's a Bible in a pew in front of you if you need it. It's also 2022, so we probably all have Bibles on our cell phones, otherwise known as a computer in our pockets. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting in verse 1. With regard to the collection for the saints, please follow the directions that I gave the churches of Galatia. On the first day of the week, each of you should set aside some income and save it to the extent that God has blessed you, so that a collection will not have to be made when I come. Then, when I arrive, I will send those whom you approve with letters of explanation to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems advisable that I should go also, they will go with me. But I will come to you after I have gone through Macedonia, for I will be going through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you, or even spend the winter, so that you can send me on my journey, wherever I go. For I do not want to see you in passing, since I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord allows. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, because a door of great opportunity stands wide open for me. But there are many opponents. Now, if Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear among you, for he is doing the Lord's work, as I am too. 
So then, let no one treat you with contempt, but send him on his way in peace, so that he may come to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. With regard to our brother Apollos, I strongly encouraged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was simply not his intention to come now. He will come when he has the opportunity. Stay alert, stand firm in the faith, show courage, be strong. Everything you do should be done in love. Now, brothers and sisters, you know about the household of Stephanus, that as the first converts of Achaia, they devoted themselves to ministry for the saints. I urge you also to submit to people like this and to everyone who cooperates in the work and labors hard. I was glad about the arrival of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, because they have supplied the fellowship with you that I lacked. For they refreshed my spirit and yours. So then, recognize people like this. The churches in the providence of Asia send greetings to you. Aquila and Prisca greet you warmly in the Lord with the church that meets in their house. All the brothers and sisters send greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, send this greeting in my own hand. Let anyone who has no love for the Lord be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with all of you. In Christ Jesus. And so Paul concludes this letter with several final thoughts, which initially seem disjunct or even unrelated. And yet, upon examination, we see the encouragement, the instruction, which Paul leaves with, is on the most important aspects of living out our Christianity. Namely, the loving service of others. First, with loving service through financial giving. Loving service through financial giving. And Paul begins by answering his readers' questions regarding the collection for the saints. This is signaled by the phrase, with regard to, which we've seen throughout this letter, as a technical phrase, meaning, you ask me this question, here's your answer. And so this collection was a huge undertaking that Paul was organizing across several churches for the benefit of the poor Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. The recipients of this collection are not made explicitly clear here, but as we look at Romans 15, Paul says exactly where it's going. It's discussed in several other letters to include Romans, Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Corinthians, uh, and probably more, but this collection from the Gentile churches is for their Jewish brothers and sisters. It is not, excuse me, it is to be not only a source of provision for the recipients, but it's also a clear sign of unity among the church. It's the Universal Capital C Church. It is spoken of with terms like fellowship, service, grace, blessing, divine service. The point is that this collection is an act of loving service to fellow believers. It is doubtful that any of Paul's readers personally know any of these beneficiaries in Jerusalem. Yet, they were to give joyfully. They were to give abundantly. And so Paul's instructions were, this is verse 2, On the first day of the week, each of you should set aside some income and save it to the extent that God has blessed you, so that a collection will not have to be made when I come. Although this is a short sentence, particularly in view of the length of the whole letter, we do well not to miss the significance of Paul's point. The significance is, the first day of the week Excuse me, the significance of specifically the first day of the week is argued about by scholars and commentators, but what is certainly clear is that there is a correlation between the first day of the week, which is the day that the early church met on, interestingly, it's the day that we meet on, and it is the day in which Christ rose from the dead. So, however all of these things work together, it was uh, fitting that as the believers went to meet together, they thought about how they had been blessed through the week, and based on that, they would set aside an amount of money for this giving. Though they were not to bring it to the gathering every week, they were to then be thinking about it and setting it aside at home. And so we can see that the setting aside is done on a weekly basis. Now, income uh, is not really the best word here. Uh, maybe your translation, translation says 
gift or money or something to that effect. Uh, but the idea is that they're setting aside some sort of material. Um, and this matters because Paul is writing to slaves, certainly not exclusively, but the way that the Greek world functioned, right, is half society or better, probably 80% of the society were slaves. And so they wouldn't have income the way that we understand you get a weekly paycheck. And yet, they are commanded to be setting aside this giving. So a more literal translation of this might be set aside whatever you've been blessed with. The idea being that as God has prospered them throughout the week, they should give accordingly. Uh, I read in a commentary, it was put this way, save to the extent that God has blessed you. It seems to hit the concept right square on the nose. So the gift is simply related to the ability to give from week to week as God has prospered them. So this final clause appears to serve two purposes, that is no last minute collection will need to be taken under compulsion, whether from Paul or the other leaders of the church, and that as folks have been setting aside week by week, the total gift will be a greater blessing. Now I hope the application for us is obvious. We too ought to be setting aside money on a weekly basis. There's a couple of things I wanna draw out here. First of all is that everybody should be giving. Now, I realize Paul here is addressing a special offering, not what we might consider our regular giving. Um, and so it could be argued that this has no relevance for us. And yet, as we zoom out and we look at the whole New Testament scriptures and what they say about giving collectively, we see that there are certain correlations here, uh, which we want to make sure we heed. So again, Paul says that each of you ought to be setting aside something. Second, there is no standard guidance to the amount, meaning that Paul doesn't say you need to give a tithe or that you need to give 20% or 2% or 1%. He doesn't say that you need to give 100 bucks every week no matter what. No, rather what he says, and this is what's important here, is give to the extent that God has blessed you. And so Paul's guidance on this matter uh, is quite similar in 2 Corinthians uh, 9-7, which is a much fuller dealing with the broad concept of deal, uh, giving. And he says there, each one of you should give just as you've decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that you, so that because you have enough of everything in every way at all times, you will overflow in every good work. So the punchline there is that God provides so that his provision may be spread around. God blesses us so we can share the blessings that God gives us. That isn't just material. That isn't always God blesses us. God blesses us for his glory so we can share those blessings. I say all of this to make the point that is Paul's point, which is his guidance for giving, has little to nothing to do with a specific amount of money, but rather has to do with a personal determination to acknowledge where what you have has come from and a decision to give cheerfully according to the abundance which God has blessed you. Now, I don't know about you, but I do know for me that I have been ridiculously blessed by God, both materially and spiritually. Some of you have met my fiancé. And indeed, in every way imaginable. And so then how could I not give back with joy in every possible way, with both my finances and material and my time and talents. I think as Americans, we are blessed beyond measure. There is no other place in the world ever, to include currently, where people enjoy freedom and prosperity like we do. Those are blessings from God. Make no mistake about that. How then do we not acknowledge God and give back to him with our treasure, our time, and our talents? Thirdly, I want to draw out that we ought to do this giving weekly. And as I mentioned for Paul, it seems that there is a correlation between the Christian day of worship Sunday and it being fitting to set aside this gift. And so for us too, on every Sunday, we gather our offerings. We uh, take a gift from you all. I would encourage you all to participate in that. 
give something weekly. If you want to do it online, that's awesome. I think that makes Sheila's life easier. Maybe it does, I don't know if that's true or not. The point is that the smallest consistent gift from a cheerful heart will greatly honor God. And so Paul then continues. So the next way we see loving service to others is through visiting. We show loving service to others through visiting. How do you define, define a visit? I'll talk a little bit more about this as we work through it. Um, I love this part of the world because you all still know what it means when I say, we're going to go have a good visit. And that means something here. I would not have met something where I last served. Um, so I say all that to say, we'll talk about a little more concrete definition. But you know what I mean. That's what I'm getting. You all know what I mean. We go visit somebody. You sit on the couch, have your coffee, or you go visit the in-laws. or That's what we're talking about. Paul here makes this point in verses 6 and 7 and following. He says, I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you can send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now in passing since I hope to spend some time with you. You see, Paul doesn't want to have just a short visit. He wants to spend time with them. He's not just passing through, but rather he wants to engage in a meaningful relationship with them. He wants to spend time visiting, teaching, uh, building, correcting, keeping these relationships intact and helping spur his brothers and sisters on in the Lord. See, further in verse 8 and 9, we see the other side of this. I'm sorry, we see a continuation. So I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. Because a door of great opportunity has opened. Again, this reveals Paul's heart to spend time in close proximity ministering to his brothers and sisters. He wants to serve for the sake of the gospel through visiting with them. He is extending his vision, his visit in Ephesus, in order to capitalize on this opportunity there. We have to keep in mind that this was not a pleasant stay for him necessarily. Right? There are surely other places that Paul would have been that were far more comfortable. And yet, he decided that he would lovingly serve those in Ephesus for the time until this door closes, on account of the opportunity available. And so in both of these examples, we see that Paul is illustrating the known benefits of an intentional visit. That is, specifically, in proximity with other believers. This creates opportunities to build relationships and share the gospel. And we see the other side of this coin as Paul continues and gives instructions on how Timothy is to be treated. He explains when they have guests, specifically Timothy in this case, they likewise do well to offer loving service as he visits. So this to be the hospitality side of a visit. And showing him respect and even watching out for him so that no one treats him with contempt, but that they may send him on his way in peace. And so as we see both sides of this coin, when we visit and when we host visitors, we understand the value here of time spent with others in person, in close proximity. I know increasingly with modern technology and transportation, these visits tend to look different. It's much more uncommon for us to host guests for several days, particularly people who are outside of our families. Um, and even then, family and friends very often stay in motels or hotels. And yet, a visit can be any duration of time. It doesn't need to be three or four or five or ten days at somebody's house or a trip to the in-laws. <laughs> what Paul is talking about specifically is staying in their homes, living in close proximity with them. Uh, as much as this is a cliche, and some of you know how I feel about cliches, um, but it's doing life with them. It's entering in that close proximity, living relationship. And so as he stays, even through the winter, he says, uh, and so too when Timothy comes, unclear how long that visit is going to be, but these instructions are to do life with them walk through things with them, visit with them, love them well. What I really want to draw out here is the intentionality which Paul demonstrates and which we must have, even more so because of our modern culture. A visit may be an hour or two coffee with a friend, hopefully a non-believer. It might be a Wednesday evening or a Saturday morning breakfast. 
probably not Wednesday evening breakfast, but I think you guys are tracking. <laughs> it might be a week-long trip to the in-laws or something totally different. Perhaps a good working definition then is a visit is just a period of time in which we intentionally do life together. For any of you who know me, you know how much that definition hurts my Oh, so many cliches. But I, th I hope you understand what I mean, right? We need to, on purpose, be spending time with one another, building relationships, loving each other well. And so looking at either Paul or Timothy's situations, the instruction here is the same. Demonstrate loving service. This builds relationships. It causes opportunities to love others well and share the gospel. For us, it might mean paying for this coffee and sitting and listening quietly for a whole visit. It might mean doing the dishes after dinner every night at the in-laws, or perhaps biting your tongue when your mother-in-law offers a loving observation, which sounds mysteriously like criticism. The point is that we are given great opportunity to lovingly serve others and foster the gospel through such visits. As broad as the word visit is, that is how broad the opportunities to demonstrate this type of loving service is. The point is, we are called to demonstrate loving service through visits. And so Paul concludes with a final point here. Is we show loving service through spiritual support. Showing loving service through spiritual support. And he begins with strong words urging his readers uh, these are all what you call imperatives, which is sort of like, it's the same way you would make a command. It says, stay alert, stand firm in the faith, show courage, and be strong. And he gives us the lens in which we are to understand how these are related in the next uh, sentence. He says, do everything in love. And so we see that these uh, instructions are not given for the sake of individual benefit. Though there certainly are individual benefits to all of them. The point that Paul is making is they should be done in love for the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Each of these, when done in love, places us in the perfect position to offer spiritual support to our brothers and sisters. Paul then offers the example of Stephanus, whose household were the first converts in Achaia. Um, that's just the providence in which Corinth is the capital. They devoted themselves, this is Stephanus' household, to the ministry for the saints. And now what specifically this ministry included is not stated here except to say that they cooperated in work and hard labor, or labored hard, excuse me. Part of what is in view is sharing the gospel message, for sure. Yet verse 18 tells us another part of the work that these men and women set about to, and that was to refresh Paul's spirit, and his reader's spirit. What a thing to have said about you. To be refreshing to a friend, to a family member, to a brother or sister in Christ. And so we can see how important Stephanus Fortunatus and Achaicus are as they're recognized as men who refresh Paul and the Corinthians through spiritual support. See, so these final lines of Paul's are Paul's own spiritual support to the Corinthians. See, despite his harsh words throughout the letter, in the end, he has nothing but greetings and love to pour out for them. This is love in Christ Jesus, to wish them support spiritually, that they might grow into a mature church. And he offers greetings of the church in Asia, uh, the greetings from Aquila and Prisca. Prisca is the same person as Priscilla from Acts. <clears throat> the church that meets in their house. All of the brothers and sisters that he is there with in Ephesus. Even in his own hand, he writes, greetings. Blessings of the Lord Jesus to you. May he come. And all of his love to them. I don't want to just breeze past... It's, it seems disjunct as we read the English translation from Paul, right? But the idea here is encouragement. It's spiritual support to his readers. 
He's saying to them, look, all these other churches, all these other people, they know about you. I have told them about you, and they are praying for you, and they are supporting you, and they are loving you, and we are all brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. This is encouragement. This is spiritual support for his readers. And the clear call to Christians from every age is that of loving service through spiritual support in the same ways. In the first way I would suggest, though it isn't explicitly stated, it's certainly implied uh, in part of the ministry for the saints, and that is through prayer. There is no better support we can offer to our fellow believers and our fellow non-believers is to lift them up in prayer, corporately, individually, one-on-one, -on -one, in small groups, and every time, place, manner, means, reason. And prayer is the first, last, and best thing that we can do for one another, for ourselves, for the church, capital C, and even little c, Copeland Christian Church. Second, we can be pillars of the faith for ourselves. This means... Stay alert, stand firm in the faith, show courage and be strong, which when done in love places us in the prime position to support our fellow Christians directly. A point to be taken away is that courage is contagious. I don't know why this is, but it is a fact of human nature that when one person stands up, it gives courage to the people around them to do the same. I have my views. But I think that we all know that that's true. And being that one person to stand firm sets the example for others to follow. This is a great way to spiritually support another person. In doing so, you provide the tacit spiritual support which is needed that another may also stand firm. Third, we can refresh others. The Greek word here, translated refresh, it means give rest or relief from toil, to revive. But as we examine its use throughout the New Testament, we can see a distinct idea that this is not talking about only physical uh, tired, uh, but rather an emotional and spiritual fatigue and exhaustion. I hope you have somebody in your life who refreshes you. I'm reminded of one of my mentors from Dallas. Any time I spent with him, it was just refreshing. It's hard to even put my finger on why, uh, but I always left our time together re-energized, refreshed, ready to take on the world. And we do this, among other ways, by listening to one another, by praying with one another, by bearing one another's burdens, by not complaining, by not being a negative Nancy, but rather just coming along one, alongside one another with encouragement and support. Fourth, <clears throat> excuse me, by simply offering a warm greeting. There's nothing like a warm smile and a hello to support our brothers and sisters. This simply communicates to them that they matter to you, despite whatever apparent differences you might have to the people sitting near you in the pews. You love them as your brother and sister in Christ. And so I want to wrap up with something that I read this week, preparing for this message. Um, it really spoke to me. It might be a little harsh. So first, let me say, if it makes you mad, don't get mad at me. I didn't write it. Uh, but second of all, I want to share it. I want to share it because it, it did really sting me. Um, first of all, that's not a real easy thing to do. Uh, but second of all, I think it's important for us to meditate on such things. As, as we listen to the Holy Spirit and, and, and can go through and, and really ask God, okay, to what extent is this true of me? What are you calling me to uh, in order to show more loving service? <coughs> so here it goes. At first it may seem difficult to apply such sections of scripture as Paul's travel plans and greetings. But as we look more closely, we can see that they have much to teach us. Through Paul's example, as well as through his instruction, this chapter teaches us to support other believers, both materially and spiritually. To a large degree, we modern Christians neglect the poor. Most of our churches set aside some money to help those in need, but not many of us as individuals are concerned about the needs of the poor. And we leave those matters to the hands of our committees, or deacons in this church. Even then, because most Christians don't tithe, our committees have little to earmark for such charitable use. 
We should follow Paul's exhortation that each one set aside something for the poor. Now, this doesn't need to be a monetary gift or only a monetary material gift. There are many ways in which we can serve the least of these in our neighborhoods and in our communities. However, we are too self-centered. We are too busy, we are too worried about our own schedules and our own households and our own calendars to make time to love others well. Or we make excuses about not feeling comfortable or equipped well enough to reach out to that neighbor, as if ministry has anything to do with our abilities. The fact is, we don't do a very good job of demonstrating loving service to our brothers and sisters in our local churches, let alone to the poor and the least of these and the neglected and those around us who need Christ's love so desperately. Perhaps our biggest problem is that we simply do not love people. Cold hearts indicate dead faith. Paul told us in chapter 13 that even if we give all we own to the poor, if we do not do it out of love, we gain nothing. Let us work on loving others, watching for opportunities to lovingly serve them well. So, like I said, that hit home for me. I think if I'm honest with myself, this is an area in which I need to do a better job of setting the example of loving service to others. I know it's been a couple weeks. Uh, we've talked about our mission statement. We're gonna to continue to bring it up. It reads, exalting Christ, proclaiming his word, building his church and reaching the lost by the power of his spirit. And what a great way to accomplish this task through loving service for others. Which brings me to our application for this week. Your task is to demonstrate loving service. I hope you all are giving financially to this church already, but maybe that's what it is. Maybe this is the week that you pray and decide, I'm going to give 10 bucks a week, period. Maybe you're already doing that, praise God. Maybe it's that you need to plan an intentional visit to that neighbor or that literal biological brother or sister who you have that strained relationship with. Or maybe it's time to call up your own parents or your in-laws and mend fences and bridges. Or maybe it's a plethora of things in which we may lovingly serve others. And so today, as we concluded Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we answered the question, what is Paul's final call to action? And we saw that it is a call to action Believers are to demonstrate loving service to others through giving, through visiting, and through spiritual support. Would you pray with me? Lord our God, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you that you sent your son to set the example of a loving servant. Father, we confess that we fall short in this area. Father, help us to have a vision of what it looks like to lovingly serve our brothers and sisters in Christ and our neighbors in this community. Give us hearts to <coughs> willingly, freely, lovingly desire to serve others in love, <coughs> following in the example of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this for your glory in Jesus' name.